Hello everyone, my name is Ryan and I'm here today. Uh, welcome to Darwin Discovery Day and I'm here to show you how to make 3D prints of fossils even if you don't own your own 3D printer. Now just a little bit about what 3D printing is, uh, if, you've never, if you're a little unfamiliar with it. Uh, 3D printing is essentially where you, uh, you make a digital model, a 3D digital model of a real life thing. Um, in paleontology we use fossils, so uh, I'm a paleontologist, uh, that means I study fossils here at uh, Michigan State University. Uh, we create these digital models of real life fossil specimens, usually by scanning them using uh, specialized equipment. Um, these scans can either be a scan of a real uh, exact specimen, so it'll, it'll be a one-to-one -one match to a real life fossil specimen, or it can be a kind of a, a facsimile of what that overall specimen should look like. These 3D models can then be printed using a, a machine known as a 3D printer, which essentially makes a plastic mold of that fossil. Now, uh, 3D prints are not a, a replacement for studying real life fossils. Uh, they're more of a supplement. You know, they help us do certain things, um, namely sharing with other people what our fossil looks like. Uh, it can be hard, you know, to get people to a fossil. We have to keep them in specialized sites to keep them stored, stored and keep them safe. And it can be hard to transport them to other places. Many of these fossils are fragile. So rather than move the fossil around, what if we can kind of take a, a 3D snapshot, kind of like taking a picture, but in three dimensions, of this fossil, and then this can be shared via the internet with other people. And they can use it to study uh, what's called the morphology or the, the shape and the form of that fossil. Now, what's great about 3D printing, uh, like I said, is that they can be shared over the internet. Uh, a lot of museums, a lot of institutions, a lot of universities, they're making 3D scans of their collections of the fossils they have, um, just uh, not just for their own use, you know, for storing and sharing these, but for other people to use as well. And many of these institutions also choose to make these scans uh, freely available uh, to the, to anyone, to the public. One of the great um, benefits, like I said, of 3D fossils is that you can share them very easily over the internet uh, as um, 3D files, and then people can download those files and print them. There's a lot of great sites and a lot of great institutions working on scanning and making 3D models of their specimens. And I'll show you a couple places where you can go to find these 3D files of fossils. There's a lot of also great 3D editing programs you can use to edit these 3D models. Uh, a lot of these 3D models you'll find online are ready to print without any editing. Some of them will be, need some minor editing, either to resize them or to change their file type so that they can be printed. Uh, there's a few different free uh, programs you can use to do this. I'll show you my top pick for the uh, easiest program to use to do this, and I'll give you a quick tutorial on how to use it. Um, a few other benefits, you know, these these uh, fossils, these these 3D printed fossils. If you're interested in starting a collection of fossils, you know, maybe you don't have currently the time, or or, or you know, due to the ongoing pandemic, you can't go out to to certain sites and maybe find your own fossils well a 3d print of a fossil is a great way to start your collection and maybe if you already have a, con a collection this is a great way to add something you wouldn't be able to get um, in the real world some fossils you wouldn't be able to attain these 3d fossils are great educational tools um, that it can be a real treat not just to see a fossil but to be able to hold it in your hands and, and see the shape of it so this is something you can usually you can't usually do at a real museum you know some fossils can be handled but others are too fragile well with these 3d prints they allow you to handle these fossils in three-dimensional space in your own hands uh, another great use of these um, 3d printed fossils uh, another great thing about them uh, is that they're not very expensive um, 3D printers themselves, the machines that do the printing, those can be quite pricey. But the prints of them, the, the things they create, are, are usually very affordable. And that's mostly due to the fact that these prints, they're done using plastic. Uh, and this plastic is, is generally fairly cheap. So you may be asking yourself, well, that's great, but what if I don't own a 3D printer and I don't want to go out and pay such a large amount of money just to get one? Well, don't worry. One of the great things about um, uh, this day and age we live in is that a lot of public libraries have 3D printers and they make these 3D printers available um, to, to their, to their uh, loaners, to, their, to, to the general public to use. Um, 
you don't even have to know how to operate or use the 3D printers. Oftentimes, as long as you can provide a printable 3D model to your library, they'll have an expert or, or someone trained in the use of that 3D printer print it for you. Uh, so I recommend that you uh, check out your local 3D, uh, your local uh, library online, of course, and, and see if they have 3D printing capabilities. Now, if you're in the uh, Lansing or East Lansing or, or mid-Michigan area, I'll show you uh, where I think you can go to go uh, 3D print your fossils, um, where I recommend you go to do this. If you're outside the Lansing or, or mid-Michigan area, I recommend, like I said, go online, check out your local library's website and see if they have some 3D printing capabilities. So there's four main steps to 3D printing your own fossil. The first is finding what fossil you want to, to print. So that involves going online and downloading a 3D model of that fossil. The second step is finding a place to get that 3D print done. Uh, what's great about this whole process is you can do it from the comfort of your own home. You don't have to actually step outside to go to a, a library or, or wherever else to get this 3D print done. Uh, you know, it, considering the ongoing pandemic, um, this makes something uh, an activity that you can do quite safely from your own home. So this involves going online and finding a local library or institution uh, where you can 3D print uh, your fossil. While you're there, you should find out what type, uh, well, when I say while you're there, I mean uh, while on their website, you should see if you can find out what type of 3D printer they use and what um, specifications or limitations it has. You know, what file type does it require? Um, what file size can it take and, and how large of an object can it print? The third step is then editing that 3D model that you downloaded earlier, converting it to a print-ready file format. Um, a lot of these files you may download online. There's a few different file types uh, for 3D models and not all of them are compatible with 3D printers. I'll show you how you can convert this uh, any type of file to, not any type of file, uh, many of these uh, 3D model files to a 3D printable file. And I'll also show you how to do some basic editing to your 3D model in case you want to resize it, uh, move it around, uh, make some basic edits in case it's too large and you need to shrink it so it can be properly printed. And then lastly, once you've edited your file, got it ready to go, ready to print, you need to submit it to wherever you're getting that print done. Uh, oftentimes this also means paying for the uh, paying for the 3D print job to be done. Uh, like I said, this is generally fairly affordable. Generally, you'll only really be paying for the cost of the materials needed for your 3D, 3D print to be done. Um, and then once your print is done, you can, you'll can you either need to go to the location where you sent the print job to pick it up, or you'll have it mailed to you. And this depends on where you're getting your print done and what their, their uh, services are that they're being offered. For example, I've got this print here. This is a uh, fossil shark tooth. You may have heard of the fossil shark uh, megalodon. This is a, a, a replica, a 3D printed replica of a megalodon tooth. Um, as you can see, it's, it's quite large, about um, two thirds the size of my hand. This print cost me uh, less than $10 to get done. Like I said, you're really just paying for the cost of the plastic. So this cost me less than $10. So that gives you a rough idea of the, uh, the price you're looking at. So like I said, step one is finding and downloading a 3D model of a fossil that you wanna print. There's lots of places online where you can find free open access 3D scans of fossils. Open access meaning that anyone can access them. They're not just owned by whatever institution made the scan. A lot of public institutions and museums like the Smithsonian actually are, are undergoing current efforts to try and scan as much of their collections as possible. So th these can sh be shared with the public. Uh, and also be used by researchers in their studies. I'll show you where I recommend you go to find 3D models of fossils specifically. So if you're uh, on your computer or wherever else, Google search this term, open source 3D models, fossils, iDig fossils. Uh, if you search that, then the first hit that comes up should be to this website, or you can just copy this URL and put it into your web browser www.idishfossils.org slash open source 3D models. Let's take a look at that site now.
So when you put in that URL, this is the first thing, uh, this is what you'll see there, uh, a page on iDig Fossils. Now iDig Fossils is a, um, a website. It's run by the Florida Museum and the uh, University of Florida. Um, they have a, the, a very nice um, paleontology department there. They do a lot of outreach work and this is part of that. They maintain this list of various websites where you can go and download 3D models of fossils. Things, places like Morphosaurus, uh, University of Michigan, um, uh, Iowa State University, all of these, these pages that this site will take you to will allow you to download 3D models of <laughs> fossils that you can then 3D print. Let's go ahead and pick one. Let's pick the Smithsonian. Like I said, the Smithsonian's undergoing this effort to digitize their collection. So let's go ahead and click that. So this has taken us to the Smithsonian 3D site. Uh, it's where they have all their 3D models of a lot of their collections. Now the Smithsonian uh, Institution, um, it's a very large network of museums in Washington, DC. Some very great collections, not just in paleontology and fossils, but arts, uh, historical artifacts, lots of great stuff. If we scroll down here, we can see, we can now navigate through all of their 3D models here. They've got some suggested places you can click on if you want to just jump straight to one of any of these that may jump out at you. Um, you can also search through their collections by the individual collections themselves. So if we, if we click this button that says collections, uh, we can see the different collections they have, the Abe Lincoln collection, collection of corals, um, collection on, uh, on Jamestown artifacts, lots of different stuff here. If we're looking for fossils, what I would recommend you do is click here where it says museums. So click on museums. This allows you to narrow your search to um, collections of a specific museum. Now, uh, all the fossils at the Smithsonian are maintained in their uh, Museum of Natural History. So let's scroll down until we see, here we go, the Natural History Museum. Click that. And we've got a search bar here. You can either look at their featured items right here. It looks like right now they're featuring some primate material. Uh, if we go to the search bar here and just search whatever, you know, think of what you would like to print and see if the Smithsonian has it. And if what you want to print isn't here at the Smithsonian, just navigate back to that iDig Fossils website and see if one of those other resources can help you find it. So let's, while we're here, let's search for something. Let's say shark. Let's look if they have any shark stuff. And here you go. Just like I was showing you before, how I 3D printed this megalodon tooth. And the, the Smithsonian has another scan of a megalodon fossil. So this is a scan that they took of a real life specimen. You could go to the Smithsonian into their collections and find a fossil that looks just like this. Let's go ahead and click that. Here on the right, we've got a lot of great information about this fossil, where it comes from, how old it is, uh, where it was found, where it is in their collections. Uh, we can, uh, while here in this preview, we can rotate it, see if we like it. Yeah, sure, let's print this. So to do that, we're gonna go here to this button, this download button. Uh, a lot of sites will only um, let you print it in, in one file size. Some sites at the Smithsonian though will <clears throat> give you a, a variety of different file sizes to pick. If you want a very large file, so you know, um, within the range of many megabytes to gigabytes, if you want a smaller file, I recommend we go with the low resolution. That'll give us a smaller file. So it'll be easier for us to download and upload and to edit as well. So let's go ahead and click on this. Download low resolution 3D mesh, click that. And there we go. So you can see here, it gives us a description, uh, Megalodon full resolution or low resolution. So resolution refers to how detailed the model is. And it also means uh, a, a higher resolution model will be a larger file size. We'll stick to the smaller file size for now. And it's a 3D mesh, so it's a 3D object. Next is OBJ. That's the file type, so it's a .obj file. Uh, and then it tells you what scale it is, what's, what's the scale for the size of it. And then here it says it's in millimeters. All right, so that's it. We now have <clears throat> downloaded our 3D model that we're going to be printing. So that was the first step. And like I said, you know, um, go through those list of websites. 
If you have something very specific in mind that you want to print, go through each of those until you find something like it that matches what you want to get printed. Or you can just browse until you find something that interests you that you would like to get printed. The second step now is finding where you can print your 3D fossil. <clears throat> like I said, it's great. A lot of uh, local libraries, I really, I really suggest, you know, your local library has a lot of resources for you to use, not just for education or research, but for fun as well. And many of them have these 3D printers. So I recommend contact your local library and see if they can 3D print for you. Many community colleges, uh, colleges, universities, a lot of these places also have 3D printing capabilities. Uh, some of them are restricted just for use by students and faculty. <coughs> Others, though, allow anyone uh, to use these, these 3D printers. So if your local library can't help you, consider if you have a local community college or other institution, contacting their library and see if they can help, them, if they can help you. Now, if you're in the uh, Lansing or, or East Lansing area, or the general mid-Michigan area, the uh, East Lansing Public Library normally would have a 3D printing space available. Currently, though, due to the ongoing pandemic, they've closed that down so it can't be used. Um, <clears throat> they still have various other services in place for you to loan materials, loan books, but they're not doing 3D prints at the moment. Fortunately, Michigan State University's library is accepting 3D prints. So at the MSU library, this is a place called the MSU Library Makerspace. It's essentially a, a place with, the, with a variety of equipment for printing and fabricating things like posters and 3D prints, and it's still in operation. Now, the uh, MSU library currently has a, a very restricted access, uh, restricted in terms of hours, who can enter, and how many people can enter at a time. Um, so you will likely not <clears throat> have uh, full access to the library building itself. Fortunately, what I'm about to show you doesn't actually require you to go into the MSU library makerspace. You can submit 3D prints and then pick them up without ever actually setting foot inside the library. What's also great about the MSU library makerspace is that you do not need to be affiliated with MSU to use it. You can be uh, sure, if you, you're a student or faculty, you're absolutely able to use it, but you can uh, just be a, a normal member of the public, not at all affiliated with the university, and you can still submit and pick up prints from this uh, resource. So it's a resource available to everyone. Now, um, in order to minimize person-to-person -person contact during this pandemic, um, once your print is completed at the MSU Makerspace, you'll either, uh, they'll either ask you for your address, your mailing address, so they can mail you your 3D prints, or they may set up a designated time and place for you to go and pick it up with minimal human contact. And which of those they choose um, it will depend on, on the, the current situation at the library. So contact them for further details on that. My print, for example, this, this tooth I just showed you, um, <clears throat> I had this print done at the MSU Library Makerspace and uh, mailed to me. So let's go ahead and take a look at the MSU Library Makerspace website. To find it, you can either Google search for MSU Library Makerspace 3D Printing, just that whole phrase there, and the top hit should be the MSU Library Makerspace, or type this URL into your web browser, lib.msu.edu slash makerspace slash services slash 3D printing. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Here we are. <clears throat> so this is what you'll see when you navigate to that page. This is the MSU Library Makerspace. They've got a few different services available. Right now we're just concerned with 3D printing. So here it shows you what 3D printers they have. Um, you don't need to really know too much about the specifications of each of these 3D printers. There are a couple things you need to know though. So let's scroll down. Here we've got their general rates, what it costs uh, per gram for the 3D print. So the larger uh, the object you get printed, the more it will cost. <clears throat> Down here we've got the different 3D printers they use. Each one has different specifications uh, and, and they excel at different things. So generally the first 3D printer you'll see is kind of the all around workhorse. This one, the Prusa, this will generally fit most of your print job needs. <clears throat> it's also probably going to be one of the cheaper options available to you. 
What we care about here is the build area dimensions. This shows you how large um, of an object you can print. So that's important. So once you find uh, how large of an object you can print, I recommend you write that down somewhere uh, to, so you can make sure that whatever you've downloaded from the internet <clears throat> is small enough that it can be printed in this printer. You can also see what colors you may be able to print in. And we've got a couple other printers as well. Like I said, these excel at different things. Uh, this one, the Ultimaker, it looks like it can print uh, larger objects. Well, this one, the, the Moai, it looks like it's good for very highly detailed prints, but it costs more to make a print, 50 cents uh, instead of 20 cents, it looks like. So a few differences between these different things. If you uh, don't know which one would be best, which one would be most appropriate for your 3D print, you can contact the, uh, the staff and, ask, and tell them what you're getting printed, the size of it, and ask if they have a recommendation for uh, which printer to use. Okay, uh, while you're here, uh, I recommend you also <clears throat> read the instructions for how to submit a print job. Here at the MSU Makerspace, they make it very clear. They ask you to save your object as a .stl file. So write that down somewhere. Okay, the file type we need for our 3D print is .stl. Um, <clears throat> so we know .stl and we know it has to be within 9.8 inches by 8.1 inches by 8.1 inches. That's our larger print can be. So write those two things down with file type and how large. How large can be the maximum size. So there we go, those are our first two steps. We found what we want to print. We know where we're going to send it to to get it printed. The third step is editing our 3D model. This means um, converting it so that it's, it's, um, it's small enough to be printed and it's the right file type. Now, a lot of places where you're going to download 3D models from, uh, you can download them ready to print, meaning you don't have to edit them at all. You might be able to download them in .stl file and they may already be small enough to print. Now, for those occasions where it's not um, ready to print, maybe it's um, too large uh, for, for that, those dimensions we just read on the uh, Makerspace website, we'll have to resize it. Maybe it's not in .stl file. Um, we'll have to convert it to a different file type, and so on. There's a lot of, of free 3D modeling programs that you can find online to help you do this. These include things like Blender, Mesh Lab. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to recommend you use a program called Tinkercad. Tinkercad is very easy to use. It's totally free. And I'm going to give you a short tutorial on how to use it uh, to edit your 3D models right now. So find Tinkercad. Google search Tinkercad, T-I-N-K-E-R-C-A-D, or go to this website, www.tinkercad.com. And let's take a quick look at that. So when you first open the Tinkercad website, this is what it'll look like. It's going to ask you to um, <clears throat> register. So um, you first go to the Tinkercad website, you'll need an account here. Uh, like I said, it's totally free, but you will need an account to use this website. So you'll need to have a, a username, an email, and a password. So you click join uh, and click create a personal account. So you'll use that to make your own Tinkercad account. The way Tinkercad works is it's a browser-based program. Um, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that you won't be running the program um, on your own laptop. Instead, you'll be running it through a web browser. So if you use Google Chrome to navigate the internet, you'll be running it through Google Chrome. If you use Firefox, you'll be running it through Firefox, et cetera. Essentially, um, the entire program is just on the website. There's nothing you need to download or install to your computer to use it. So this is what Tinkercad will look like once you've logged in. Tinkercad uh, is, is uh, really one of my favorite 3D modeling programs to use. It's very simple. It doesn't do a lot of things, um, but it's very easy to use and very quick, quick to pick up. You can um, use it without any real uh, training or tutorials at all. Although it does have uh, a few really nice um, pro, uh, 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 tutorial programs to get you started. So let's take a look at that um, Shark 3D model we downloaded from the uh, Smithsonian. So we'll click create new design. Let's take load that up. <clears throat> so this is the space where we're going to be doing our editing 
for a 3D pro, uh, model. We're going to import that model we downloaded from, from the Smithsonian into Tinkercad. So you click to import. What we can do is we can click and drag that file directly into here, or we can click choose a file, navigate to where we've downloaded that file, and um, upload it. All right, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the Megalodon file that we downloaded from the Smithsonian website. Now, Tinkercad has a limit to how large of a file you can uh, upload to it. So if your file is too large, you'll have to um, go back to the website and see if they have a smaller version of that file available to you. Uh, it looks like this is a small enough file for us to upload, so that's good. Um, the scale, don't change that yet. We'll change the scale manually. In fact, don't click on any of these things. This just gives you an idea of how large it's going to be once you upload it. Um, click on import. And there we go. So that took about <clears throat> a couple minutes for it to import. It may take longer, it may take shorter, depending on the size and detail of your model. But we've got that model in here now. Just like on that preview on the Smithsonian page, we can uh, move this around if we want to preview. So I can move this around this 3D space to look at it. If you want to look at your object in 3D space here in Tinkercad, you go to the top left here where you've got this cube. And you can click and drag this cube to rotate your object, see what it looks like. This square represents your work plane. Um, think of it as kind of the base of the 3D printer where your print is going to be uh, constructed. So this is generally what I want to print. I want to print this, um, <clears throat> this here, shark tooth. So there's a couple things we need to do while we're here. We need, like I said, make sure it's the right file type and make sure it's small enough to be printed in that 3D printer. So let's first make sure it's small enough to be printed in that 3D printer. We can measure the size of it here within Tinkercad to make sure that it is um, small enough for us to print. Now what we're gonna do is uh, measure the size of our 3D model to make sure it's small enough to be printed by the 3D printer site. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on this tool that says ruler, click that. Then you're gonna click on the object itself. So I'm gonna click right here. Now it's measured our object for us. Um, so if we look around here, we can see that our object is 122 uh, length by <clears throat> 145 height by 43.44 depth. What are the units of these numbers? Well, Tinkercad does everything in millimeters. So it's 122 millimeters wide by 145 millimeters tall by 43 millimeters uh, thick. Now, if you think back to when we were looking at the uh, MSU Library Makerspace website, it told us uh, the dimensions of how large our file needed to be in inches. So what that means is you're going to need to convert these units in millimeters and convert them into um, inches to make sure that this is small enough for us to print. Now, if your object is too big for you to print, we're going to need to resize it. In other words, shrink it so that it's small enough to be printed. Uh, to shrink it, you shrink it much the same way you would shrink an, an image that you're editing in, in maybe PowerPoint or, or Word. So if you click on your object, here we go, it's now got drawn this square around it uh, with these four points on the corners. Click on any of those points, click and hold while holding shift. Uh, so hold down shift, click on that point, and if you move your mouse around, you'll see it resizes your object. And as I resize it, because I have the ruler tool still on, it tells me uh, how large it is. So I just need to make sure I shrink it so that it's small enough to be printed in that 3D printer. A lot of things you'll download online, um, depending on how large they are, will be totally fine to be 3D printed without resizing. Some larger things though, you'll need to make sure you resize so they can be printed in the 3D printer. So that's how you resize them. Uh, in, so that they can be 3D printed. Now, uh, Tinkercad has a lot of <coughs> great, very basic, very simple 3D editing tools to use as well while you're uh, while while we're here. So, uh, you know, if you're happy with your 3D fossil as it is, we can now convert it and get it sent in to get printed. But maybe you want to do some basic 3D editing. 
for example, I was, I was showing you this uh, 3D print of a shark tooth earlier. Um, I could edit this how I wanted. What if I wanted to edit it to add a base to it? See there, that base. I got its own little display base on it so that if I uh, want to display my tooth, it has a built-in base for me to do that. Uh, <laughs> doing something like that, very easy to do in Tinkercad. So while we're here in the workspace, let's go ahead and turn the ruler off. Now, um, remember, top left here is to rotate your, your view of the space. Uh, let's say I want to edit this to add that base. First thing we're going to do, I get, we're going to edit the uh, tool here. So I click this, uh, oh, that was the wrong thing to click, sorry. Uh, up here, I should show you in the top left, is the undo and redo buttons. So undo, redo, just like you would in, in Word or PowerPoint or anywhere else, you can undo and redo actions. Um, now let's say I want to move this up a bit. So that's what this top arrow is for. So I click that and I can raise this up. Uh, your mouse wheel or these plus and minus buttons here will zoom in and zoom out your view of your 3D model. I can now click this, this kind of curvy arrow here will let me rotate my model. So I'll kind of rotate like that, that looks good. Let's raise it up just a little bit more. Here we go. Now let's add a base. Uh, over here on the right, Tinkercad gives you access to a few different shapes. Let's click on just basic shapes. Um, these are shapes you can add to your 3D model. We'll click on cylinder. So I click on cylinder and I click and drag a cylinder here into the 3D space. Now here it is, inside the same 3D space as the fossil tooth. So I'm going to click and drag it so it's just underneath the tooth. Uh, that looks pretty good. And let's raise it up. So this is going to act as the main support for that. Um, base I'm making. Let's change the angle of this just a little bit. It's a little more vertical, perfect. So let's move that support in. So this is gonna hold up my fossil tooth, just like that, that's what it would look like. Uh, let's add a base now to this display base I'm making. So I'm gonna add in a box. So I clicked on box, I, I dragged it in. Let's make this box a bit wider. So it can uh, hold up this tooth without danger of it tipping over. It doesn't need to be that thick, so let's shrink it down. So just like you would edit the size and shape of an image, a 2D image in Word or PowerPoint, you do the same actions here in Tinkercad. Very easy to pick up. And there we go. We've got our fossil tooth from the Smithsonian with a very basic um, base attached to it, so it'll be able to stand up on its own. All right, so once you're happy, with your um, 3D model, we can export it. So over here on the right, top right says export, click on export, <clears throat> and we want to export it for 3D printing. Now, uh, depending on where you're sending your 3D print to, they'll ask for your 3D print in a specific file type. The MSU library in Makerspace asks for 3D print files to be sent in in .stl format. Uh, that's totally fine because Tinkercad lets us export in .stl. STL is uh, one of the more common 3D printing file types you'll see. So we'll click .stl. It says it's preparing model for export. And uh, once it's finished preparing that for export, export, you're gonna download that file back onto your computer. So unlike that file type we started with that we downloaded from the Smithsonian, this file has not been edited. It, we, we resized it to make sure it's uh, small enough to be printed. <clears throat> We've converted it to a .stl format. And just for fun, I added this little plastic base to it so it'll be able to stand up on its own. That's totally optional. If you just want the fossil by itself, like I have here, you don't have to do any of that kind of 3D editing. <clears throat> All right, so we've got that downloaded. The next step is going to be uploading that file uh, to wherever we're getting our 3D print done. Once you've ed, uh, uploaded your file to that site, um, whoever's in charge of it, in this case, the MSU Library Makerspace, um, they'll take a look at that file, make sure it's compatible with their printer, and then they'll start printing it.
Now, the, the actual act of printing itself, it, it varies how long it's going to take, depending on the type of printer and how large your object is. And um, how long it takes is going to be until you can get your 3D print um, depends on, like I said, the size of the 3D print, how large uh, the type of the 3D printer, um, how busy the library is or wherever you're getting your print done. You know, do you have to wait your turn until, you know, are there other people getting that stuff printed and you have to wait your turn? Is the library very busy, uh, the reduced staff? It could take some time, uh, anywhere between hours to even a couple of weeks. Um, a lot of these locations, including the MSU library, have reduced hours and reduced manpower due to the ongoing pandemic. So uh, be patient when it comes to this. <clears throat> Once you upload your print and you've submitted it for printing, you're going to have to um, pay to get it printed. Like I said, this is generally fairly affordable. Um, these, this tooth, like I said, cost me less than $10. So that gives you an idea of <coughs> what you should expect to be paying when it comes to these 3D prints. Uh, generally, um, when you send in these 3D prints, you'll be contacted by the library via email, uh, and they'll provide you with a quote of the price of what's going to be printed so that you know how much it's going to cost before you commit to getting it printed. If you agree to the, to the quoted price, um, you, you'll, you'll confirm it, and then they'll get start printing it for you. Once the print is done, they'll either ask you for your mailing address so they can mail the tooth to you, or I'm saying tooth, but whatever it is you're choosing to get printed, uh, they'll either mail your 3D print to you or they'll uh, ask, uh, arrange a specific time and place for you to come and pick up your uh, 3D print. So let's just take a really quick look back at that um, Makerspace website. So if you're printing through here, through the MSU library, you click on, we're here on 3D printing, you click Submit Job via 3D Prime there. You'll need to make a, an account here <coughs> on the Hollander Make Central website. Uh, so you'll make an account. Um, you'll need a username, an email, and a password. You'll upload your um, 3D file to that website uh, within a certain span of time. I, I, in my experience, usually a, a couple of days, they'll email you back with a, price, a quoted price. You'll email them back saying whether or not you agree to that. If you do, you'll pay for it right then and there via credit card. Um, and then uh, once the print is done, they'll either mail it to you or ask you to pick it up. Uh, oftentimes, this is a process you can do without ever leaving your home. Um, if you want to have it mailed to you, you can, you can ask them and say, is this a service you can provide to me? And in my experience, it's something um, they're expand they're, they'll, they'll be able to do for you to the ongoing pandemic to try and limit person-to-person -person contact. Uh, now, um, I just want to let you know, this is, you know, the pandemic obviously is an ongoing situation. A lot of things are changing all the time. So um, be patient with the library and the makerspace. Uh, this is a service that they may have to alter or, or change or maybe even um, have to, to put a temporary stop to, depending on how things are going at the moment. Uh, last time I checked with them, this is a service they're still uh, offering uh, to not just students and faculty, but the general public. And they're still offering um, services to, to mail 3D prints to you once they're done so you don't have to come onto campus to pick those up. Uh, a few tips and tricks when it comes to these 3D prints. Like I said, four simple steps, a few things to really maximize this. Uh, I recommend for your first few 3D prints, keep them simple and keep them continuous. In other words, make sure your print is one single object, you know, like this, this tooth here. Um, try to make them continuous so it's one object, not multiple objects together. No holes in the objects, no, no weird overhanging things, just one sim single solid shape. Once you get some practice with it, or, or once maybe you, you do a bit more research in uh, the complexities of 3D printing, you can move on to more complex shapes. But just for your first few 3D prints, I recommend you choose something simple. Uh, it'll print faster, it'll cost less, and it'll, it's less likely to malfunction in the process. I also recommend you avoid flat fossils, um, things that are that are imprinted on the surface of something, uh, like a like a, a skeleton flattened out or something like that. These may not look too nice when it comes to 3D printed. They're certainly capable of be being 3D printed, but just in terms of this, of how they look, they might look look, look how you might expect to. Uh, here I have a, a 3D print of a uh, what's called a a, um, uh, a Ediacaran fossil, so a very very old. Um, Precambrian uh, animal, uh, and it's an imprint on a bed of sand. Um, it's 
unfortunately not uh, a very vis visually uh, exciting to look at as a 3D print because it's so flat. Uh, for research or education, this works just fine, but if so, this is something you want to uh, use in your own home just to, to have it in your collection or something that, like that, uh, reconsider having something so flat. Things that work great though for first time 3D prints, uh, nice simple solid shapes, uh, fossil bones, leg bones, arm bones, rib bones, teeth, claws, um, dinosaur claws, dinosaur teeth. This stuff works fantastically for 3D print prints. Nice solid shapes, uh, very low likelihood of malfunctioning. Um, very nice to look at. Something else to know, 3D prints, they're not toys. I, I recommend don't 3D print these, uh, expecting to use them as toys. These are great educational tools. Uh, adults can handle these, children can handle these. These are not meant for, uh, you know, rough housing or, or play acting or anything like that. Um, if you want your 3D print to be handled by small children, I avoid any 3D prints with, with thin or, or dangling bits that can be snapped off and acting as choking hazards, so avoid that. Uh, and like I said, they're not meant to be toys. Um, more solid ones can be fairly durable, um, but they can also be fairly fragile depending on the thickness of the prints and these shouldn't be exposed to any kind of rough housing. Something else you should know, most um, 3D print locations uh, will let you choose the color of the print depending on what kind of plastic they have. If they, don't, if they only have access to one plastic though, they'll, the, they won't be able to give you that choice and it'll likely just come out in gray plastic. Either way, it will come out in one single solid color like this white tooth I have here. If you want to get it colored, I recommend doing it yourself. You can make a great fun activity, get some paints, paint those different parts of the of the fossil, um, paint maybe even uh, um, uh, different ways to color it. Um, be creative, or if you just want to be accurate, look up a picture of your fossil from wherever site you downloaded it from and see if you can recreate how it looked in real life. Some fun activities there. And you know, 3D printing isn't just uh, limited to fossils. This is what I work with. Like I said, I'm a paleontologist. I work with, with 3D printing for fossils, but lots of other fields use 3D prints as well. Biologists and anatomists um, and even uh, people in the medical field scan, the or stand, scan different organs and body parts and 3D model them to get a better understanding of how they work and what they look like. Chemists may make 3D scans of different mo molecules and compounds. Uh, archaeologists, historians, um, make different scans of important 3D artifacts that you want to study. Architects make 3D models of buildings and maybe even 3D print those to make 3D, uh, to make physical real world models of the buildings they want to make. The list goes on and on of, of different fields that use 3D models. Uh, for example, in that list of um, different sites where you can find 3D models that I showed you at the beginning of this video, one of those sites is the NASA website. And they have a collection of different 3D spacecraft and satellites and other models um, that you could print as well. So lots of different places, not just fossils that you can find. So if you have passions outside of just um, paleontology and fossils, consider thinking if you want to do any 3D prints involving those. In fact, during today's Darwin Discovery Day, while you're going through the uh, different uh, rooms we have on offer today with all our different experts and volunteers, consider asking if they've ever used 3D modeling or 3D scans or 3D printing in their field of work, or if they know of others in their field who have used them. Uh, I hope you all have a very fun and educational Darwin Discovery Day today. Um, this is the end of the presentation here. Uh, this is a pre-recorded video. This is not live, so uh, feel free to rewind to any point in this video if you want for, for a refresher on any of these steps. Uh, you can rewind to all those links I showed you and pause them so you can write down those websites if you want. Um, and like I said, just go ahead and you can get printing. This is a great fun activity, educational, something you can do uh, during the pandemic. And I hope you all have fun doing it.